What does it mean to love one another? Is it an emotion of the heart? An act of service? A force of the will? Can love ever truly be defined? We think so often in simple terms, but real love goes much deeper. It strengthens the weak, helps those in need, lives in harmony with all people and holds us accountable. Love means carrying each other's burdens, admonishing and instructing, showing compassion and feeling it too, spurring one another to good deeds, confessing and forgiving, building and maintaining trust, being of one mind no matter our differences. Love means accepting others for who they are and allowing ourselves to be changed in the process. So love holds us together, grafted by faith into the one true Christ, whose example compels us to love one another. Hi, my name is Jovan Barrington. I'm the senior minister here for the Littleton Church of Christ. And I wanna thank you once again for watching and worshiping with us at Littleton Church Online. If it's your first time here, or if you're returning back with us, uh, I wanna remind you or point you back to last week where Stephen Matkins, our young adult ministry resident, uh, preached a message in our series, One Another, on encouraging one another. So he, he asked you to encourage one another. And if you missed out on that sermon, I want you to go back and listen to September 13th sermon preached by Stephen Matkins. Very proud of what he did and how he brought God's word to us. Now, Stephen wasn't lying in his message. He said last week was the last in this series, one another, but I've decided that we should continue it just a bit longer. So hang with me as we explore today being kind to one another. If it's your first time here, we're so happy that you're with us online. We do something at the reading of God's word together that I'd ask for you to participate in. If you could stand at the reading of God's word, if you are listening to this on a podcast, if you're doing something, I ask you just to take a pause right now so that you can receive God's word fully into your heart. God wants to change you and we want you to see Jesus and we want you to be changed as you see Jesus, as you hear people speak about him, his disciples who wrote about him, as I preach about him and his word and the principles that come through the life and the messages of Jesus, you want to be changed for the better and you have to take a pause to allow that to happen, okay? I want us to stand if you're willing and able and then help me in reading God's word. I'll be reading aloud what's in white. If you will please read aloud what's in yellow. This is the word of God for the people of God. Ephesians chapter four, verses 29 through 32. The apostle Paul writes, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. This is a reading from God's word, Ephesians chapter four, verses 29 through 32. If you believe God's word, say amen right where you're at or say amen in the chat. Say, I believe in God's word. I was recently listening to a podcast that explores the details behind the, behind the shooting death of Ahmad Arbery. Ahmad Arbery was a 25-year-old black male who was jogging in Georgia on February 23rd when some people seeking vigilante justice or misguided justice uh, cornered him with their vehicles and he was shot and killed. An eyewitness and fellow assailant, William Bryan, confessed that after Travis Michaels shot and killed Ahmad, that he used a racial slur over Ahmad's dead body. It was found also that on his phone and others' uh, phones that they used these racial slurs multiple times when corresponding to people. This was discovered during their initial court hearing and the defense for Travis Michaels said that the, this was normal behavior in the South, that 
People in the South, in Georgia and in the Southern states, uh, would say what Travis was saying, and it was generally accepted to use racial slurs in conversation with one another. They tried to normalize it. And we've also bore witness of private conversations being leaked to the public that degrade women and that it's been referred to as locker room talk. It's, it's just how guys talk to one another when they are being themselves. And a defense of words or phrases that tear people down instead of building them up that says, hey, everybody does it. Well, that's not an acceptable defense of an unacceptable practice. I mean, if using racial slurs is normal conversation in the privacy of people's homes and phones and in their conversation is degrading women is normal, then we need a new normal. Can I get an amen? Say, we need a new normal. And if you, by chance, are tempted to say, hey, I may have said something hateful to somebody else, but what about that other person who's probably said something far worse than me. I want us to lean into Jesus and his way of thinking and stop whatabouting someone else and take responsibility for your own self. Stop whatabouting away someone else's demeaning and destructive behavior and excusing its impact. Instead, own what has happened and choose to make a difference in righting wrongs. See, I was recently in a Christian Facebook group that shared funny memes and discussions surrounding one of my favorite sitcoms. And there was one meme that the moderators approved that I did not find funny, and many others did not either. And I shared that it was not funny, to which a person in the group set forth to antagonize me online repeatedly. He was not interested in building anyone up. He wasn't interested in building me up. And that is a persona that is tempting to take on in social media, one of the bully. And we see that happening in public spaces and in news channels and opinion pieces written by our favorite digital newspapers and magazines. And you may be tempted to hold two different personas in your life or multiple personas, like a private presence that harms others or an online presence or a text persona that tears people down. But I want you to listen to me very clearly. Lean in. I, I know that we already know this, but we need to be reminded of this. What you say in private is you, because what often happens to people in public spaces, and it comes out that some of their private conversations are now in public spaces, and they're found to be abhorrent. They're found to be disrespectful. They're found to be unloving and unkind. And they say, that, that's not me. And oftentimes what we try and do is remove ourselves from the things that we said. <laughs> but what you say in private is you. What you say in public is you. What you say in person is you. What you say online is you. It's all you. And God warns us, Jesus warns us that we will be judged by what we say and what we do. Now as believers in Christ, we won't be condemned. But know this, that you will be judged by every word and deed that you choose to do. See, you might be thinking, what I say in public may not always be me. What I say in person may not always be me. What I say online may not always be me, may not always be me. And what I say in private may not always be we, but it, it's, it's all you. And God wants all of you, not just all of you, the number of us that are watching and listening to this online, but he wants all of you. That means your whole self. He wants you, all of you, to live a life of love and service, and kindness, and compassion to one another. God wants that private you. God wants that public you. God wants that in-person you, and God wants that online you. There's a scene in the office where Michael Scott says to a high school student who's interested in working at Dunder Mifflin as an intern, he, he's telling them about Pam, who is the receptionist at the time for Dunder Mifflin Paper Company. He's telling this intern, he says, uh, about Pam, he says, I would never tell this to her face, but she is a wonderful person and a gifted artist. And then Oscar, the accountant, says, what? Why wouldn't you say that to her face? You need to tell somebody to their face 
something that builds them up today. Do you need to reach out to somebody and whether it's by FaceTime or you go over and knock on their door or you meet them for a cup of coffee, you as a follower of Jesus Christ must choose today to uplift someone, to build someone up today. Because as followers of Jesus Christ, we must ask ourselves, whether I'm in person or online or private or in public, am I being genuine? And whether in person or online or private or public, am I being hurtful or helpful? And in any situation, in any season, whether we're in plenty or we're without, whether we're in sickness or in health, whether it is election time or it isn't, uh, we need to understand in asking ourselves this question, am I being helpful or hurtful? I have a practice of writing out responses to people, but never sharing them. It's like I'm tweeting to myself. I have learned this practice from others. And maybe it's a practice that can help you to be somebody who builds up instead of tears down. And maybe you need to be holding a document that's building others up and then you share it. Because we don't want to be people who are in the habit of tearing down others. Because tearing down others hurts the Spirit of God. This is what Paul says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Don't cause harm to the Holy Spirit of God. He says, do not let any unwholesome speech come out of your mouths and do not grieve the Spirit. See, I don't know if you know this to be true. If you're listening today or watching today and you're not certain about the God that Christians believe in, Jesus who's been resurrected from the dead, that we give our hearts and our very lives to, that has rescued us and has given us purpose in our lives. You, you may be uncertain about this Jesus and this, this God, this Holy Spirit, because of how you've seen people who identify as followers of Jesus or people who identify as evangelicals or people who identify as mainline people in this world that's, that are, that are, that's full of Christians. Uh, you, you, you may see how some people act and respond and say, well, I'm not sure about Jesus. But I want you to know that even if you have experienced harm from somebody else, God did not send Jesus to harm you. The things that maybe a follower of Jesus may have done or allowed or have turned a blind eye towards, that does not represent Jesus himself. That we want to be followers of Jesus and follow the true Jesus, the, the Jesus that doesn't seek to harm you. Because Jesus didn't come with a hammer. He accepted the nails. And the Holy Spirit of God is not out to harm you. That Jesus describes the Holy Spirit as one who comes to help you. He is called the helper. He is, the Holy Spirit is an empowerer and an encourager. He builds you up when you've been torn down. You may have received harmful words from someone or you have been the recipient of someone's rage and anger and their bitterness and cruelty towards you. You may have been on the receiving end of that, and that means that you have been wounded. And that's why that when you have seen that happen in your life, or maybe whenever you are in disagreement with someone or you want to express yourself, because since you've been wounded, you may be tempted to speak ill of people. You may have been tempted to slander people, speak behind their backs. You may be choosing to be, you may be tempted to choose to, to gossip and slander them. But in this case, you need to allow God to heal you if you've been wounded, because God wants to heal all of you. Remember, not just all of us who are watching, but your whole self, all of you. Because you know this to be true. You've maybe experienced it in your life, been on the receiving end, or you've been on the giving end of this. See if you know this to be true, that hurt people hurt people, but help people 
help people. That wounded people wound people, but healed people heal people. That giving into bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, and cruelty is not the way of Jesus. It's not the way of forgiven people because the way of Jesus is to be healed and to help and not to harm and to wound. And the way of Jesus is forgiveness. That when Jesus was on the cross, he said, forgive them, Father, for they knew not what they do. Now, listen, now I'm not saying forgiveness is easy. Or am I saying that forgiven people forgive people is in some way weaponizing you in your hurt to forgive someone else? No, but what I know this is to be true is that people who've received the forgiveness of Jesus and that have received the Holy Spirit of God are able to forgive even when it is impossible. That forgiven people forgive people. Bill and Ted, who just came out with a new movie, Bill and Ted face the music, they would say, be excellent to one another. And in the movie Bill and Ted, I haven't seen it yet, but I read a little bit about the plot, that they travel into the future and they run into their future selves. Now, if you've traveled years into the future to find your future self, what might you expect to find? Because you've been going through what you're going through and you've been going through a lot right now. People have been saying a lot of things, blaming 2020 for all the wrong that happens. I mean, that's just what happens. We personify a year. But it's not just this year. The world has been this way ever since the fall of mankind. 2020 is an exceptional year in terms of the hardship, the loss of life. It's unprecedented, to borrow that cliche, for many of us. The loss of life and the loss of jobs. What's it doing right now to you? What's it doing in your home? What's it doing in your job? How's your faith holding up right now? In 2020, did you imagine you'd be where you are right now? I mean, how has it been affecting you and how have you been able to rely on the strength of the Lord so that the things that the world wants to normalize, you're resisting. You're saying, I don't want to normalize that. If you traveled light years in the future to find your future self, you might be thinking, man, that'd be great to get out of 2020, but who might you expect to find? 2020 has been hard, but it's in those hard times where we are pressed, but we are not crushed. It's in those hard times where we are pressed, persecuted, but not abandoned. It's in those hard times where we are refined. Like it would be a shame if in 2020, 2021, that we didn't find ourselves becoming more like Jesus because of the refining fire. We chose to put our faith in Jesus so that God could mold and shape us. And that even in the midst of hardship, we're choosing to be a blessing. And even in the midst of struggle, we're choosing to give strength. That we're choosing to fall on our knees in prayer. We're choosing to love and not hate that we're choosing a new normal. Like, what's the new normal going to be? This is the new normal. Listen, who you become in the future depends on what you choose to normalize in the present. And here's what we normalize. Be kind and compassionate to one another. That through Jesus, you could choose to normalize compassion and kindness. And this has always been a kind and compassionate Caring church. I remember the story of when Justin and Allison Thompson, our former missionaries to Lima, Peru, and they had their support dropped by another church overnight, that this church stepped in to help them. And you may have stories of this church and others that were there for you and they were kind and compassionate for you in your time of need when you needed the people of God the most. 
My family recently traveled out of town to a wedding. We just came back from Alabama. It was a wedding of a formal student of mine and when I was a youth minister for over 11 years at the church in Dothan. And her parents are good friends of ours. And the father, Jeff, was one of my youth deacons and eventually became the youth minister when I departed the church in Dothan. They're good friends of ours because they were there for us when we needed somebody to be there for us the most. That We were transitioning out of the ministry in Dothan, Alabama, and we'd already sold our home, had all of our stuff in storage, and we were living in my sister's house temporarily. And while we were living there, a storm came through Houston County, Alabama, and blew a large tree down into my sister's home, causing over $50,000 worth of damage. And we had to vacate the home. And with nowhere to go, they took my family of five into their home. And we stayed there in their bonus room until we could find another place to live temporarily. I would never forget, I would never forget their compassion and kindness shown to my family. While at the wedding reception, a mother of some of the other students, there were other students who were part of my student ministry, she shared with me that they were just recently recalling some of the memories from being in youth group at the time. And one of the things that they remember was my acceptance of them, no matter what. That they knew that they were part of a group that, that loved them and that our ministry taught them God's acceptance and love and that they recently were recalling it and that they were choosing to practice what they had been taught. And sometimes you wonder, do people listen? And sometimes you wonder, are people watching? And sometimes you wonder, are you making a difference? Sometimes you wonder if people go right and you go left. Is it, is it worth it? Is it worth all the, the, the hardship that comes when you do such a thing? Is it worth it? Well, it is worth it. Are people listening? Are they watching? Are they paying attention? They are. They are. And we've been paying attention. Anna and I, we paid attention because shortly after we moved here to Colorado and began our ministry, Anna and I and our family experienced a kindness and a warmth and a welcome that we had never experienced before in a church. And what I see in you, Littleton Church, and if you're watching, you want to know more about this church, what I see in you is a church family, is a body of believers. That if people would listen whenever you're kind and compassionate, it would change their hearts. Church, I want to leave you with this reminder. Always, 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 without ceasing, be kind and compassionate to one another. Always, always, always. Never stop. Never stop. Though you may be tempted, and though you may be weak, and though your will may be exhausted at times, you go to God because God is kind. God is compassionate. He wants you to be kind and compassionate to one another. If you're looking for kindness and compassion, then you found a beacon, a storehouse full. We're trying. We're not always there. I know you're trying and you're not always there. But God says, keep pressing into it and keep trusting and keep, keep being filled with the Spirit so that you can be kind and compassionate to one another.